And I'd like to just welcome you to this September 2021 textual study on the Bible and Beyond discussions. I'm your host, Shirley Paulson, and our presenter this evening is Dr. Hal Tausig. In this study, we'll be talking about rethinking the revelation to John. Hal says it's time to revisit the issues around this last book of most canons of the New Testament. It's been contested even before there was a notion of the New Testament. This evening, we'll be examining in particular two very different ways of interpreting this text. And we'll let you decide what you think about that. I do want to mention that we'd love it if you're ready and willing to make an ongoing pledge of support via Patreon. Go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, Bible and Beyond, to make a pledge that's just right for you. You could also make a one-off donation by using PayPal or a check if you prefer. Check the chat box here or the website for details. And we thank you so much. It's great to see you. And Hal, it's all yours. There we go. <laughs> thanks great. so much, Shirley. Great. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us. Um, we've had uh, about uh, two years ago some conversation about the uh, revelation uh, to John, and we look forward to, to more this evening. It's a book of the Bible that um, has occupied a lot of my time. Um, uh, I did my um, um, doctoral dissertation um, on the revelation to John, and, um, and so I spent a lot of time. I, I want to just to let you know um, um, how much trouble you're in uh, in that regard. Um, so I did my dissertation under um, Burton Mack, um, and he and I were doing a lot of very experimental work um, um, a long time ago when I was doing my dissertation. And we agreed that I should do a full dissertation that would not be written, um, but that would be performed. Um, so um, I, I wrote an entire um, drama with, that included every word of the revelation to John. Um, and it, and I, I then directed um, a two week uh, play on it, that my entire, um, not only my entire uh, committee that judged it, but also um, hundreds of people came to see. I was also in the play, as well as directing it. Um, so uh, I think it might be helpful to say now that I, in many ways, have not changed my mind at all that probably most of the early writings of the early Christ people were not originally writings, but performances. Um, and, and so um, my, I wouldn't write the same play um, as I did um, uh, 700 years ago, um, um, uh, uh, but I, I do think that in many ways, we probably misunderstand <laughs> most of the texts if we think that they are uh, written texts like we are, have written texts in our postmodern time. So anyway, um, let's then jump into some study. As, as many of you know, we'll um, take it in chunks and um, and we'll stop for conversation uh, fairly quickly. Um, I, I want to, to just say a few words introductorily um, uh, about the text itself. Um, the, almost all of the versions of the text are late, meaning we don't have a complete uh, manuscript of the, uh, of the Revelation to John until at least 400, if not before or if not afterwards. Um, so it's, it's pretty um, late. Um, and by, by 400, P 
people knew something about it, whether it was a complete text or not is not clear. But by the 400, there were lots of people who were saying they loved it and lots of people who were saying they hated it. Both of those group, groups were, were Christ people. Um, and um, it's probably true that that the the text never actually um, was was welcomed fully by any stage of of Christianity. It's always been a very contested one. Um, some people in some parts of Christianity in the world today still don't accept it. Um, uh, and and so um, we also need to acknowledge that. Uh, for instance, Martin Luther, as he was trying to put together a uh, for for um, Reformation Christianity, as he was trying to put together uh, what would be a New Testament, he, um, uh, in as much as there was a New Testament in play at that stage, and I think there was, um, uh, he wanted to kick the revelation to John out. Um, so he made lots of efforts to to actually just um, get it out of of the of the New Testament. Um, at the same time, even before that, at least for six or seven hundred years, there were many people who were devoted to all kinds of important understandings of the Revelation to John. And again, here is probably. Um, correct to say that we can't find many places where everybody was on the same page uh, as to what it meant. But it is true that there were many parts of the, the history of church in which a lot of people were, were very excited about it, but probably didn't agree uh, on exactly what the, the meanings were. Uh, I want to just take a, just a little bit of an overview uh, um, of, of the, the text itself uh, and, and how it's shaped. It is a little bit messy um, as, as, a, as a document. Um, it, its first, its first um, chapter is, is a chapter that is a it is a twofold introduction to Jesus, uh, but those twofold pictures um, take different images, and they're almost all images. That is, it's a, a picture of a person um, who is clearly a powerful divinity um, with many different pictures of himself. Um, and 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 so that is a kind of a a um, in the first chapter we have a, a sort of a set of visions pasted together of Jesus. Um, uh, I'll here I'll I'll give you in case anyone needs some reminding. Um, uh, here's just a couple of sentences from that first chapter. I turned around to see who was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of them, one was like a son of man, dressed in a long robe, tied at the waist with a belt of gold. His head and his hair were white with the whiteness of wool, like snow, his eyes like a burning flame, his feet like burnished bronze when it was has been refined in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of the ocean. In his right hand, he was holding seven stars. Out of his mouth came a sharp sword, double-edged, and his face was like the sun shining with all its force. So Albert Durer in the in the um, uh, in the early uh, I, I guess one might say the, the the late Middle Ages or the early um, uh, Renaissance um, he actually tried to paint what's in that this uh, the uh, what I just wrote and and of course every, everybody immediately said no it couldn't be like that. 
Um, uh, but uh, in other words, this is still a set of images on top of one another. The next thing to say is then after that picture of Jesus, there more or less out of nowhere are seven letters to seven, seven different communities um, uh, in Asia Minor. And, um, and um, we, have, we are told why there are seven um, letters, because the rest of the book doesn't have any letters and doesn't mention the seven letters that are at the beginning. Then we have a whole set of visions um, beginning with the vision of Jesus and God and all kinds of other characters um, in, in the sky. Um, uh, and uh, then there are a whole bunch of um, visions that are dark and um, full of violence. We might say that at that point, there begins to be a story. This is, would be about in the middle of the book. There are 21 chapters. Um, uh, and the story is, as it sort of comes into focus as a story, um, basically the story is of a cosmic battle between uh, the God of Israel um, and um a, a, an empire that is, take, is destroying the world. And then at the end, um, the, um, the God of Israel um, basically disposes of, um, ruins the empire that has been um, in charge of the Mediterranean world, and um, then all of the earth disappears, and all of the heaven disappears, and a new heaven and a new earth um, um, are, are, are made at the end of the story. That's, that's you know, that's almost the story, I, I think. Um, 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 we could ask other questions about it. But so that's a picture of the text itself. Uh, let me just stop here for for other of you who might want to have to add what you know about what the story or the text of the, the revelation uh, of John is, um, and um, and and if you would have some protests or thoughts uh, to begin our time together, that would be fun as well. Okay, well, we can, we can go on. Um, I, I want to just briefly at the beginning uh, give you um, a kind of a summary of uh, my thinking on the Revelation to John. I've already told you that I've spent more time on it than probably any other book in the Bible. And, and, I, um, and I, I have deep affection for a, a great deal of it. What I want to propose tonight is that what has happened in, in over the last, I want to say, 100 plus years, the, what the meaning of the text of this document is, has basically um, come into focus in two, um, two, two um, opinions that are opposed to one another. The first, I would say, um, is the smaller group, probably hundreds of thousands or uh, a million or so, or maybe 10 million, I don't know. But this is this, uh, what one would call the mainstream scholarly opinion. And that is that um, the meaning of this text is that the God of Israel uh, has promised to defeat the Roman Empire because the Roman Empire has too violently um, uh, subsumed 
all of the other nations of the Mediterranean. Uh, that's that's so. I would say that's a um, what most contemporary scholars and their followers would describe as what this text is. There's a really interesting dimension to that in that that never happened. That is um, what actually happened between Israel's God and Rome was sort of the opposite. That is um, Israel was uh, removed from nationhood completely by Rome and, um, and none, no Christian or Christ people related groups ever defeated um, in the first several centuries ever defeated Rome. Uh, so the story is then an imaginal story, say, this, say um, these, the scholars of our day. This is a pose really in many ways um, uh, by one major religious source. Um, and that would be led by what should be probably called something like the leaders of um, Christian fundamentalism around the world. And there the main image or the main description of the by far more numerous people who have read the, this book is that the point of the revelation to John is to, to give us a picture of a future led by God that destroys the earth um, and brings both a new heaven and a new earth. And that that is the re that is the point of this book. So my, my um, suggestion then, and we'll return to this in some detail, I think, um, is that those two groups are not going to get together, I think, ever. Um, so I think there is a huge standoff between the two major people who are talking most about the revelation to John in, um, in our time. Now, what I just told you is in some ways complete bunk in that um, there are many other people in, in the history of uh, Christianity and of, of humanity that have had many different other visions of or understandings of what the revelation to John is doing. Um, right now, there are just these two main groups that are dominating everything. But many of the people who live in other traditions, Christ, uh, of some kind of Christian or other traditions, a number of them um, are still chugging along uh, in their own tradition that's different than these two dominant um, um, categories. Uh, so I um, want to ask Shirley then, um, as we've been preparing for, for this, to say a little bit about just some sample um, other ways of thinking about that, even if it's not the dominant two that I propose. Right. Well, thanks. You know, I have a, a PowerPoint I want to show you. So let me bring up the PowerPoint. And while you sort of get this adjusted on your um, picture, I just want a second, me too. Um, just sort of everybody's got different ways of handling their pictures and a PowerPoint. So you might want to juggle things around for your screen. But the idea that I want to show you is to just get a, a big overview of history. I think Hal has done such a great job showing us that so much has gone on and what's happening now. And look, we're going to go back in time and move back up to the current time, just as a big overview. So um, I think the first thing we wanna look at is um, the fourth century with Augustine, because I'm um, starting with the fourth century, Augustine was arguably the most influential thinker who changed the meaning and direction of the majority of Jesus followers. Mostly he used the revelation to John to interpret his own contemporary time, which is again, four centuries after Jesus, or three centuries anyway. <clears throat> and 
and he's using this uh, rather um, than using as a future prediction of the world or of the church is for his own time. So he stripped the Antichrist, Gog and Magog of any future meaning. The revelation to John was important for understanding church in his time, but he did not think of it as a sign of a good Christian empire. And then we jump up to the 16th and 17th centuries where we have now the this is the time of the Reformation. So things are changing a lot in Christianity. So <clears throat> we have the, Catholic, the Calvinists and the Lutherans. And as you know, this is the beginning of the Protestant Reformation where they've stirred the pot in every direction imaginable. They thought of the revelation to John pretty much in terms of its contemporary Christian enemies. So for example, the Geneva Bible interprets Revelation 14.1 as a very anti-Catholic message. That's the verse that you might be familiar with. It says that there are 144,000 who come in the Father's name on their foreheads. And the Calvinistic interpretation of these 144,000 could not include Catholics. So in fact, there's this quote here that says, there can be no vicar for where there is a vicar, there is no church. As a vicar was a, a deputy of the, of the bishop for those of you who don't know a vicar. So in other words, it's saying that the Catholics just don't belong here. The revelation plagues in a series of seals and trumpets and bowls all refer to the corruption of the church from within. This is by the Protestants here. So then there's Martin Luther. He also read it in that way, reading revelation as anti-Catholic. But you should just sort of realize that this approach to revelation now has almost completely disappeared from the Protestant view. So then we'll move up to the 18th century and we find William Blake and Swedenborg. William Blake was very important within different kinds of Christian, sort of Christian and non-Christian publics. He used many images and thinking from the revelation to John. And he's probably the most important historical teacher and artist concerning the revelation to John. Although he may not have ever seen hell. I don't know what your, your show was like, Hal. I'd like to see that. Anyway, Revelation to Blake was a powerful example of social prophetic impulse for his day. He thought it conveyed the religion of Jesus filled with a spirit of forgiveness and divine imminence. Late 19th century, most Christian biblical scholars and church leaders and theologians saw Blake's devotion to Revelation as a direct challenge to the God of the Bible. Blake's writings and drawings still draw attention today though not within church or Christian theological spheres, but within art and what we might call mysticism. So at the same period, Swedenborg took a very spiritual interpretation of the revelation to John. Everything for him was symbolic with inner meanings. For example, the seven lampstands enlightened Jesus with the love he received from God. The holy city of Jerusalem is full of symbolism and understood by angels who give the internal or spiritual sense of the word. And then jumping up to the 19th century, Mary Baker Eddy founded one of the American born metaphysical religions of the 19th century. And even though her parents were Calvinist Puritans, she took an entirely different path. She saw the revelation to John as a culmination of all the teachings in the Bible itself. It was a prophetic vision of the end of evil where in a kind of spiritual warfare, the goodness and power of God will finally reign. It's a picture of the present possibility of discerning the new heaven and new earth without having to abandon humanhood. And now we'll jump into the 21st century. It's still going on. Richard Rohr explains that the apocalypse is meant to shock, forcing us to lose all human control and allow the birth pangs of the new life to take place. The revelation to John for him was not meant to strike fear in us as much as a radical rearrangement. It's the end of the world that we have created, but not the end of the world as far as he's concerned. So just take a quick look at the credits. I just wanna show you that if anybody has any questions about these pictures, I have them all here, but that's really what I wanted to show you. So thank you. Thanks so much, Shirley. Um, you can get a, a, a real wonderful sense of, of the diversity that um, uh, 
what I'm going to t uh, propose to you um, um, does not um, take as much account of as it, as it could. Um, so let me just um, say a few more things about um, the, uh, a, a, a few um, things in the text uh, that helps us get an, uh, a sense of um, what, what um, it sounds uh, like to scholars. Uh, I'm going to just read a little text, um, part of the text from the chapter 17 and 18. Um, and it goes like this. Come here and I will show you the sentence passed on that great harlot who has had licentious intercourse with all the kings of the earth. The seven heads are the seven hills on which the woman seated. There are also seven emperors. Come out of her, my people, so that you may not participate in her sins. In a single hour, your judgment fell, and the per merchants of the earth weep and wail over her, because no longer does anyone buy her cargoes. Alas, alas, great city. So um, I choose this just as one uh, way to notice how, um, how clear it, it could be um, to see that this is about the first and second century. It is about um, Rome's complete domination of the Mediterranean and how much violence Rome has used in conquering so many nations and tribes um, in the first two centuries. Um, and and um, here, however, this text uh, is shouting out that basically what has happened is God is in the process. No, in this particular text, this says that God has already uh, defeated Rome and Rome's no longer making buying cargo. Um, everybody's weeping and wailing over Rome um, and it's done. God has finished um, and completed the, the, um, the total dismissal of Rome and now all people are um, ready to be to to come forward um, in in God's great love. Uh, so uh, this um, I would I do want to say that um, on every page of the uh, of of the document. Uh, scholars find this amount of clarity, but there are a number of places where it, se it seems very difficult to ar argue against um, a, a, a first and second his um, century history that actually is projected in story and vision form, uh, but never happened, um, but was hoped to happen. Uh, uh, and then, um, just to remind you of my what I, I want to show as um, uh, a, the other main way of thinking about this book in our day and for the last hundred years has to do with the vision um, that this destruction by God of an evil empire is yet to happen. Um, and, and one can, in the text of the Revelation to John, um, one can figure out when that's going to happen and how. Um, some people are um, of this very large 
group of, of people around the world. Some people are still in the process of thinking about how God is going to do that. Um, other people feel fairly certain that the Bible and the revelation to John is already clear of how that will happen in the future. Okay, let's stop here. We've gone a little longer than we usually like to before we get you into this. Um, uh, but I, I want to now have you think um, some more um, uh, about um, questions, thoughts, uh, and um, um, arguments you might want to have um, uh, as we look at the, the, especially these two ways of thinking about it. Um, I have a, uh, something that's a little bit different approach. Um, hey. Yeah, this is Diana. Um, I had uh, studied, we, uh, well, there was, I had a, a group that we were doing a Bible study and we did Re the book of Revelation. And we were trying to comprehend what it was about in terms of, and it seemed like, like Shirley said, like a spiritual warfare. And I see it as a, within the individual. It's like the individual does this battle over and over. And actually the, the structure of the fight that is given in um, the, the book of Revelation, it reminds me of Plato's line, you know, like there's a, it's in uh, the Republic, mm -hmm. chapter six, and he has this like a vertical line and he has these levels. And the bottom level is like these images that are cast on the sh like shadows that are that the average person takes in and and feels as their their sense of the universe. And then through um, you know uh, somebody basically in the story of Plato, somebody from the outside comes in and gives direction to leave the cave where these shadows are being cast and come out and points out that there's a world out there that's greater and more magnificent than anything inside the cave. And he basically feels like it's mathematics that leads people out of this, you know, the study of mathematics, this is Plato, out of into a higher and higher levels. And I was thinking like, well, for John, it's prayer and the word of God that leads you out to higher and higher levels. And that's, that's sort of how I, I, I found that book, the book of a revelation, a phenomenal book in terms of that. Uh, it really had a real meaning to me after I finished studying it. And I feel like if you, you know, instead of, there is a, um, like you could have like the Roman empire, but then you could also have like what we've been through in the last, in the 20th century, with the Nazi empire and the communist empire, we're all dealing battles with these evil empires, so to speak, uh, one way or another. And, and it's an individual battle and we have to keep fighting. It's not an easy fight and it seems kind of repetitious, but also in our, in our individual journey, in terms of our lives, it's sort of like we have our ups and then we, we think we, we've, surmount something and then something along comes along and dashes our, our sense of who we are and we have to start up again and, and, and do the journey again, battle it again. But each time you go, it's sort of like zigzag, but it goes, you know, you get better, you know, get more um, expert at this type of warfare. That's, I mean, that's sort of how I feel about it. Thank you so much, Diana. That, um, I, I think that's so helpful. Um, for us in that um, when we look at, at the different eras of, of humanity since this, this material w was born, I think what you're talking about has been a way that many people have, um, have found a way um, to, to relate to it. Um, so I, I think that um, that adds really very importantly to the kind of um, uh, little picture that Shirley gave of the big picture. Um, uh, Shirley, would you, um, would you see that as particularly um, 
like any one of the folks that that you um, uh, were talking about us. Talk yeah, about. I, all right. I think it, it, it fits with the um, metaphysical world where you um, the, the, you take it as an individual consciousness rather than an, an external um, uh, relationship with another empire. So I think that what there's it's, I think she's bringing out, Diana's bringing out an important point that you can read it as an external battle or an internal battle. And I think that was predominantly a 19th century phenomenon. Mm, thank you. Other, other questions, thoughts, um, puzzles? Uh, <clears throat> My grandmother was a Jehovah Witness. And mm. so uh, this whole book of Revelation uh, played a big part in, in my family and my in her beliefs, not not mine, but in, in her beliefs um, about um, the new earth and the new world and who was uh, able to go to the new world, to the new heaven, and who was going to stay on the new earth. Um, and I think for a lot of people, um, Revelations is kind of like, like what you said, how it's a little a mix of both of the academic and the funda fundamentalism, um, especially uh, right now with everything that's going on. If I had a nickel for every time I hear these are the last and evil days, I'd be rich by now. And so, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, and so I think there is a group of people looking for um, the answers to when will it all end? You know, uh, I listened to what Diana said, and and yes, that that's good that the ups and the downs of life. But some people are just tired, and they don't, they're tired of the ups and downs. So when does it come to an end? When do we get to that that new heaven and that new earth? When does the battle begin, so that we can rise from our sleep and and start over fresh, and and not go up and down all the time? And I think. Um, there's a big group of people who are in in a part of that belief. Um, and, and it's hard to address. I, I taught Revelations last summer to a group of uh, women from my church just so to get the spookiness away from it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, as a kid, um, we used to talk about it in church. We didn't even want to go to the back of the Bible because we, we didn't want to deal with Revelations because it was so scary. Um, but it was ironic that I took the academic route of teaching, trying to show them the allegory and, you know, uh, <laughs> where it comes from and the book of Enoch and, and, and they, they listened, but they were not really receptive. They were, they wanted to hold on to, uh, just let us know when the end is coming so we could be ready. <laughs> so I think, mm -hmm. um, that, that hardcore belief is, is in there. And I'm just wondering how do we help people get past that? Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Oh, one, I, I'm liking to think about both your mom um, uh, and and what she brought to it, and then the people you were teaching with, because those that's kind of different and kind of um, similar, isn't it, in terms of what they were looking for. Yeah, my yeah, my grandmother. Um, oh, grandmother, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And she went into the Jehovah Witness late in life, you know, as a senior citizen. Um, but there was this this staunch belief about this new heaven and this new earth, and and I remember going to church with her on Easter. Well, not to church, to the hall, and the the communion came around, and one of my favorite parts of church is communion. And so when the communion came around, my eyes lit up. I was about 15. My eyes lit up and one of the church members like nudged me and like, no, no, don't take it. <laughs> don't take it um, because you're not a part of the 144. <laughs> oh. Uh -huh. yeah, you're not a part of the 144. So you're not to take, we, we don't take the communion. We're going to be on a new earth. And so you know, that's that's not my theology. That's not what I was raised in, in the AME church. Um, and so I was like, why wouldn't you 
Tell you, why don't you want to go to heaven? Or everybody's not going to heaven, 144. So that fundamentalism um, kind of falls out uh, into the to community. You know, there are a lot of people who take that verbatim. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's really interesting from my point of view um, to notice that to a certain extent, the text itself is intentionally confusing. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not quite meaning that as a joke, um, uh, but just to give you an example, that text that I just read from chapter 17 and 18, there you may have noted that the, the great um, uh, sex worker, um, mm-hmm. harlot, um, um, uh, uh, in one other translation, um, uh, is a, a great evil person sitting on seven hills. Now, so that is not nothing when one is a historian, as, as I am among other things, um, uh, to notice, because of course, Rome is famous for being built on seven hills. Now, the word Rome never is in the text. But what this, what one may begin to notice is that it has a lot of subtexts. Um, And why doesn't it say it directly? Because actually, actually there's a pretty big tradition by Rome to crucify anybody that criticizes them. Right. So this entire text, um, scholar, many scholars would say, is 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 coded intentionally, but is but is coded very directly against the horror of what Rome is doing. A second thing in that is um, in in chapter eighteen, you would also come to see that um, it's saying. Um, the great uh, empire, emperor, uh, and empire have have been over, overthrown, and that is Babylon. Now, of course, that's goofy on one level, right? Because Babylon was a great empire um, six hundred years before, and so one wouldn't that so but it's in the same paragraph as the seven hills. In other words, what this does is almost secretly say, you remember that huge empire that destroyed so much of the Middle East? That's the one on the seven hills. Right. Um, uh, But it never gets around to saying it's Rome because it doesn't want to be killed. Um, so, so, um, uh, but I think, um, especially what you've said, Reverend Stephanie, um, uh, um, uh, uh, is very true that in our day of so much turmoil, people are so frightened that they need to have some some way forward that is assured. Um, my question in terms of a scholar is um, when you look, when you're a careful student of uh, the revelation to John, you, uh, of John really, uh, you, you have, um, you, when you look at it carefully, it's really almost impossible to make into a clear plan. Right. <laughs> and, and, right. And I think, you know, towards the end of the teaching, they were like, I like I lost some students towards the end um, because, like you say, it, it's coded. Um, it's a poet's dream. I'll say that I'm a poet. And so, you know, a lot of poetry is coded. And so um, to decode it and to to demystify it was a lot of a lot of disappointment for some folks. They they wanted the mystery. They wanted the the codes, but they wanted it to be, you know, what they were taught. The the end days are coming. And 
everybody's going to pay for what they've done to you and, and don't you worry and 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 like you say it's 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 so confusing only 144,000 are going to get into heaven but then there's the scripture about the magnitudes in white that can't be counted right and so, and so you know make it make sense and and so <laughs> Some people hold on to the 144. Some people hold on to the to the the, the white, you know, the uncountable the people going into heaven in white. And, well, and so, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah, and and just thinking of that 144,000, when you read the next the, the next sentence, it turns out that all 144,000 are men, right? Because right. they have <laughs> all kept their virginity. Now that's a real great picture of uh, 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 that. So let, let's see if we've got some other people who want to jump in here. Um, we'll have it all wrapped up tight in a real good um, uh, uh, package in a few minutes. Just kidding. Hi. Yes, uh, Janice. <laughs> Hi, Hal. Um, so could you talk a bit about uh, the person who wrote this? Would he have written it with a purpose, like did it get did it get secretly passed around and people kind of at the time knew what he was talking about? Like, um, cause I always thought that this guy John had a dream and he wrote it down. And then the dream was very meaningful to the people at the time. Like they all knew what he was talking about. I'm just wondering. Um, if you could talk a little bit about what that was like. If you yeah, know. and th thank you. Um, uh, and uh, I'm going to just um, give a summary uh, with the 21 chapters. We, we won't quite get to it at all. But um, I'm pretty sure, I would say that it's almost certainly written by a number of different people at different times. Oh. The first thing. Um, and so the, a number of those people may have been writing to each other, and a number of them almost certainly were not. Um, but all of them were gripped by the fact that the world that they lived in was being, um, was killing millions of people with the violent uh, uh, work of, of Rome. So in other words, I, I, I want to say this is pretty certainly a bunch of people who all know that, um, um, that they want some, some great divine persona to take up their, their position and, and to, to, to fight it. And, and, and so, um, uh, I think that it's therefore because it's different people. You've got different scenarios that don't fit together, but you have an overall leaning on what I would call Israel's God, meaning Jesus is God, Israel's God, because that's who Jesus was, as they see it, see it. Um, and that, um, and and that. Um, it has more of a, a set of visions for the future. And yes, there is, they are giving themselves into that hope. Um, but they, they, you can see there, there are places in that text where the text admits that it's on two or three pages at the same time. Um, uh, but I wouldn't want to say that, that is therefore needs, needed to be discounted, nor is it discounted necessarily because it didn't happen. Rather, what we have to say is in, in those two centuries, I would say from a historical point of view, th this is fairly easily seen as a whole bunch of small groups around the Mediterranean who are saying, we have to say no to this people who's destroying us. And we have to, to um, follow um, the God of Israel um, in that way. Now, the, again, there's so much irony there because, of course, as I said at the beginning, Israel gets 
finally completely defeated. Yeah. Uh, but as a people. Rome, Rome takes it over and and says, hey, now we, we're taking it all and we're going to make our own church out of it. I mean, it's just, <laughs> it's really ironic. It's right, it is. Yeah. So, so th um, that's about as good as I would get Janice on um, saying um, th this, like many ancient texts, this does have, when you look at it closely, this does have some real meaning that can be that can be related to the same agony that they were feeling then. Not exactly. Uh, in other words, no, hardly anybody is worried about Rome right now. Um, but but it, it it is a it is an ancient text that is is leaning on a a hope for for the world. Yeah, you know, it seems to me like um that mankind is always thinking that the world is going to end. It just seems like we're in this, we think we're in this special time where it's like, you know, like um, Stephanie said that we're so close to the end times, but I feel like man, humanity is, has kind of always been there. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. I think we're special, like somehow that we have this existential crisis, but I think that we're always in that challenge and we have to, that uh, this book is so amazing that way because we can see these symbols and all these things. And it's, it's exactly our time. It, like Shirley was saying, it's all those different centuries. They saw it. They saw meaning there. And so um, that's just fascinating to me that we're, we're always trying, striving for that um, that salvation that's somehow going to save us from ourselves. Yeah, and and what I'm suggesting is, yes, there are all a bunch of us cooking on different uh, burners in terms of what meaning may come for us in our time from this text. But I think the a big conversation in our time is almost impossible now um, um, because there are two main dominant thinkers or thinking crowd. Um, it's the, the futurist um, fundamentalists and the, the historical scholars. Mm -hmm. And, and um, I've been in decades of trying to put those people in the same room and getting somewhere. And, and I'm, I'm not finding it true. And I, as a scholar, I refuse to just keep the scholar's side. I think there's too much at stake um, um, uh, um, to think that somehow uh, the funny old scholars I know could be, the, be on exactly what we need. Um, uh, so, but I do want to say, it seems to me for the time being, um, common ability to hear one another um, in, on that scale is, is really strong. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Gosh, I'd like to just say really quickly here that um, what I love about this conversation tonight is you're bringing it to us, the two kinds of forces that are struggling to get together and maybe are not succeeding, but it's helping us to hear the other side that we may not have heard ourselves mm -hmm. so that we can participate in the conversation in some way. So I'm appreciating that about this, Hal. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's like, it seems to me, I, I've, um, scholars like me, um, winning battles of this sort is hollow. I mean, I'll keep up that work. But I'm, it doesn't seem to me that ignoring the the um, this massive group of people who are um, um, about the future um, that that seems uh, hollow for me, for me about my work. Do you foresee? Um, 
the fundamentalist thought um, being challenged in some way that might make it move? Or do you see that it's, it's um, pretty much fitting with the way the world is going, so there's no reason for it to change? Mm. Um, on this topic, it seems to me as if um, talking across each other is, is so far gone. I myself think that um, um, there's a lot of new, interesting possibilities in fundamentalism that is getting into to very helpful territory. Um, and, and so I, it feels to me like for liberals to paint um, fundamentalists into a corner as to who they really are. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that a whole bunch of, especially young people are saying no to the older fundamentalists and are thinking new thoughts. Um, I don't know where that will go, but um, it feels to me as if um, uh, just calling each other names across um, boundaries um, is actually not what the way it all is going, and it has little point. Um, one of the things that I talked about at the beginning, I'll just say again, is, and I, I think that um, Diana had um, some interesting possibilities there too. It seems to me that um, the, the, um, the imagery of this text is a new way into it um, that that might uh, make for some new conversation. In other words, um, as you were saying, Stephanie, um, you're a poet. I, I want the poets um, in on these conversations because poetry really knows how to, to find images across um, uh, boundaries um, that I think has a lot of possibility. So, so it seems to me that this, text is really inviting reading it as poetry, not as future um, um, real um, history or as just ancient history. Um, but, but I think it has quite a bit of um, um, imaginal um, uh, place to, to, to for, for some meanings to come forward. I know you've got to wind up pretty soon, but maybe you can, in terms of imagery, do you have a word to say about where the imagery of Babylon really came from at that time? Oh, well, everybody knew Babylon was so great. And this is just, this was just the writers wanting to, to say, look at how terrible Rome is without getting crucified. I mean, that, that is, the writers don't want the, um, to write something that's so obvious that, that somebody will knock on the door and kill them. Um, I think, it, yeah, everybody knew about Rome and had big stories of Rome. I've also heard that um, Jerusalem is considered uh, built on seven hills. And Babylon was the opponent to Jerusalem. Yes, yeah. it built on seven hills. I, I was, yeah, definitely. Uh, I, I would, I would think that that's a real possibility that the writers are playing, playing with both. Mm -hmm. um, and it would be, of course, really helpful if that was a, a double play on two different spaces, since the, the book itself ends in New Jerusalem. Yeah, no, I think that's very helpful. I was just thinking that, you know, I have friends who believe that this is the end times. And so Jesus is coming soon and all that. 
um, that story. And I was just thinking, well, none of us knows what the future holds. So we can all keep an open mind and not just call each other names like you were talking about. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to happen, neither do you, right? So we just have to love each other somehow and listen. Yeah, and again, it could be that they're just little little or medium-sized chunks of the poetry in this text that, yeah. that might be both comforting and, um, and challenging in, in, in ways that could bring some forward movement. I think that the way we get the fundamentalists in the same room with the scholars is by the artistry of poetry, the artist of the yeah. arts. Um, yeah. And also looking at, I know I've counseled and I've preached about individuals last days. You know, I've, I said, Jesus comes every day. Mm. Jesus, yeah. Jesus comes every day for someone. And so uh, are we looking at our last days? The last days happen every day, especially now in the midst of the pandemic. There's last days every day. And so instead of waiting for that big last day, are we preparing ourselves for our own personal last days, right? Um, and, and, yeah. And that's not at all far from what Diana was saying. Right, yeah. right. But, but, you know, for the fundamentalists, you've got to, at least this has been my experience, you've got to really talk about that end, right? That, that final end. Yes, we go through the ups and downs, and that I use that that analogy in counseling folk. But for the for eschatology and the and the, the teaching of the end days, um, we're so focused on that big end day, right? Just like just like uh, is you know Israel when Jesus was walking the earth, right? And they were waiting for Jesus to come and do this big thing. Just, you know, kill them all and take us, we'll take over. And so people are so waiting for that, that they're missing everyday living and missing what can we do with your last day? What what will you do with, <laughs> with your end days, you know? Yeah, yeah. thank you. Oh, is that, because um, I, um, I belong to a group that has different people coming to talk to us. And somebody pointed out that Einstein felt that the idea of having individual consciousness is an illusion and that we are all one with the universe. There's no separation. And I love that concept, what, you know, in terms of what Stephanie and everybody's been saying, it's like, there's a oneness, even though we're fighting it all individually, it's a oneness with everybody. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, thank you. And Shirley, I know we're over time, uh, but thank you for letting us, <laughs> go on a little bit longer. Oh, I think we're all happy to have had this conversation. <laughs> I, I just, I think we're all hungering and thirsting to get to know this text a little bit better and you've whetted our appetite even more, Hal. Thank you so much. So yes, this was the September 2021 textual study on the Bible and Beyond discussions on rethinking the revelation to John led by Dr. Hal Tausig. Once a month at 8 to 9 p.m. Eastern time on Monday nights, generally the fourth of the month, we provide a discussion of one of the early Christian texts. Dr. Hal Tausig leads these sessions, sharing a well-framed overview of the particular text and allowing participants time to ask questions and share their insights. I will say that donations supporting the creation of these textual study archives really are appreciated. You can now make an ongoing pledge of support via Patreon. Please go to Patreon dot com that's p a t r e o n dot com slash bible and beyond to make a pledge that's just right for you you can also make a one-off donation using paypal or a check if you prefer check the website earlychristiantexts.com for details thanks so much and we'll see you next month thank you